you know, one of the only cases from history that I think you can't explain with, you know, Chinese lanterns or some other types of mis mis uh, identification would be like the 1561 Nuremberg case where they they literally thought they saw a sky battle take place. And you have to wonder if there's like type three and two civilizations out there, maybe there is a Star Wars type battles that have happened. And, you know, some of that stuff is debris that's floating around it's, it's asteroids some maybe some of that stuff's fallen to earth and landed and and you what would have happened over history if say you know some the roman army found something like this where would it where do you think it would be today and where it would have ended up hey folks welcome to the dark horse podcast i have the distinct pleasure of sitting this afternoon with jeremy riss also known as alien scientist he is perhaps a bit obscure to most of you i have been following his work for years i initially encountered him in the landscape of what are colloquially known as conspiracy theories and what set jeremy apart was his scientific approach for every conspiracy theory that he believed in, he seemed to debunk a dozen. And I know that conspiracies exist. I am pleased to find anybody who deploys a proper scientific toolkit in sorting the wheat from the chaff. And so in any case, I've been, I've been watching him from afar. More recently, I've been paying attention to his work on so-called UAPs or UFOs, as those of us who have been watching this space for years, formerly called them. And I've invited him on Dark Horse to talk to us primarily about the UAP question. Are we being visited by extraterrestrials? Have we been in the past? Should we expect some sort of contact between us and them in the future? So Jeremy, without further ado, welcome to Dark Horse. Thanks for having me, Brett. I am, I'm a big fan of the podcast. Awesome. So I'm not sure quite where to start here. I will say um, most of my audience is probably not terribly familiar with the UAP question. They've, of course, read stories in the mainstream press and, uh, like me, don't know exactly what to think about them. I'm certainly cautious, and the reason I haven't ventured down this road very far is that so far what I've seen has the feel of a PSYOP to me. This feels terrestrial in origin, which does not mean that I don't believe that there are extraterrestrials with advanced technology in the universe. In fact, evolutionarily speaking, the fact that we exist suggests the likelihood is very high that there are many other such civilizations. But as for whether or not they've been to Earth, um, I'm a skeptic, and I thought you'd be the guy to help us sort it out. It's an interesting question when you're dealing with... Um... You know, when we study things in nature, we tend to use blinds. And as many scientists who are studying this phenomenon has pointed out, how do you study something that's studying you and doesn't want you to study it? And this perhaps technologically thousands of years more advanced. Maybe it's, you know, you know, so and uses invisibility cloaking and stealth technology that's way beyond what we have. Um, so that's this is this is a good question about whether they exist or not and whether what we're seeing out there is actually them because if it is them then they obviously want to be seen as longtime listeners will know heather and i spent 15 years teaching in an experimental educational environment it was one of the most rewarding experiences of our lives and that is why i am so excited about the sponsor for this episode ralston college Ralston College is a new institution of higher education with Jordan Peterson as its chancellor. It is currently accepting applications for its one-year Masters in the Humanities program. That program begins with two months in Greece with immersion study of ancient and modern Greek on the island of Samos with visits to Olympia, Ephesus, Delphi, and other sites in the ancient world. After Greece, students continue their educational odyssey in beautiful Savannah, Georgia, with a multidisciplinary curriculum featuring philosophy, literature, art, music, and architecture. This is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, and admissions are now open. There are a number of full and partial scholarships available. For more information, please visit ralston.ac slash 
Dark Horse. That's R-A-L-S-T-O-N dot A-C slash Dark Horse. If you're ready to do the hard thinking our era demands. Right. Yeah, I was gonna I was gonna say exactly that. To the extent that the modern UAP version of whatever is taking place is happening, uh, those entities want to be seen, whether they're terrestrial or extraterrestrial. Um, whatever cloaking they have is obviously not working because we have a large number of highly credible reports. People have certainly seen something. Yeah, this is there's a number of cases. The Battle of Los Angeles, they they fired anti-gun turrets, you know, anti-aircraft guns at this thing for hours. Obviously, there's there was something there. Um, some people suggest it was a, an early form of this uh, projection technology that they were using multiple spotlights as well. Um, it was in the Hollywood Hills in California. So they had a lot of these spotlights that they'd shine in the sky back then. And so they had them all pointed up at this object and they feel like that some, somehow that could have created a, um, a hologram effect. And, and that's indeed how I believe they created the Tupac hologram on the stage. It, they used like a smoke machine and three projectors uh, to uh, triangulate the, uh, the imaging and, um, so wait, wait, I, sorry, I'm going to keep slowing you down because I want to, I, I really want to understand this. My impression in the modern version of the UAP question, the thing that stands out to me most is that you have what appear to be objects. They appear to be moving through the atmosphere at speeds that are improbable without an apparent um, m means of propulsion, which could of course just mean they use some other kind of propulsion. But the thing that really doesn't sit well with me is that they don't appear to make a tremendous noise, that the displacement of air is, you know, who knows, aliens could have technology that would cause the air displacement to be neutralized in some way that we can't understand. But if they're not bothering to cloak themselves visually, it's a little hard to understand why they would be doing that. And I'm even doubtful that it could be done that effectively. Or whether it's whether it's being done by them at all, or whether the, oh, these things are man-made altogether. And that's one thing that's missing from a lot of the mainstream conversation is the technology side of this. And the people that the, the mainstream, if you do get the technology side of this, anyone, you ask anyone at any UFO conference how UFOs fly, and your answer is going to be element 115. Um, and it almost seems like they've poisoned the well on the uh, scientific, uh, you know, physics side of this. Anyone in the physics community that wants to get into UFOs is, is sort of hit with this, you know, oh, God, this is just not something I even want to associate myself with. Um, scientifically or academically. Um, whereas if you really get into the science, like in those OSAP uh, DIRD reports, that's the Defense Intelligence Reference Documents, um, you can search that on Black Vault and, and, and uh, come up with some of uh, those files. You get into the real cool stuff like uh, metallic glasses, for example, which have uh, elasticity and strength beyond, you know, carbon fiber, beyond uh, steel and, and, and other things. Then, and um, you talk about metamaterials, which are used in cloaking devices and invisibility shields. And um, also apparently in some of these warp drive skins, allegedly in the terahertz range, um, interesting stuff you find and, you, and then you get i was looking into terahertz and what scientists were working on terahertz and looked up classified terahertz and found oh here's a guy that was working at wright state university right next to wright patterson who brought a bunch of you know work home with him and uh got a year in prison for it because it was classified um related to whatever he was doing that the u.s air force was apparently you know funding or interested in because they're the ones who showed up and, and busted them. Um, so you find interesting cases like that, um, which I, I kind of, I don't think anyone was reporting on that story. It was out there in the news and they had broken it. The, the first re news report actually was from, you know, Fairborn, Ohio. And it was, um, it, it said that they busted the guy for uh, a, a marijuana grow 
And then like the story changed, it wasn't really marijuana plants, it was classified documents. And that was just kind of the throw, you know, people off the trail. Um, but the, the real story came out and um, I, I picked it up and I, I don't know if anyone else picked it up or really talked about it, but um, I thought that was an interesting connection because it kind of verified, well, at least they're doing classified research related to this. You know, maybe it was a, maybe it was a setup or a plant, but uh, yeah. that's, I don't know, to get a guy to do a, a year in jail, that's kind of hard for a PSYOP. So, um, well, I mean, yes and no, that you, look, it's not hard to come up with a proof of concept of how you might get somebody, uh, willing to spend a year in jail. Either they've got something on them and that was a better deal than he might've had, or, um, you know, obviously, uh, most people will have their price and, uh, Anyway, it's not hard to imagine how it could be done. I'm not saying it is. Yeah, yeah. You know, but I just go look look down the. It's hard to you know look down the conspiracy rabbit hole sideways at some of this stuff. Um, cause, can I uh, can I back you up a bit though? Uh, there's something that you uh, you breezed by there that I think is important for us to discuss. Uh, and you you just feel free to correct me wherever I've got this wrong. No, because, slow again, me down because I'm just, I go off on this stuff. I've been doing it way too long. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. You're, you're in deep. Um, with respect to things like propulsion technology, um, A, I should say uh, my brother, Eric has obviously been active in this discussion. Uh, and one of the things that he points to is that the, crossing of large distances, which is the number one obstacle, presumably to any advanced civilization getting here, might actually not really be about propulsion at all. That it might be about space and time not functioning in the way that we have come to understand them, and that it might be possible to cross large distances without actually crossing them. And this is necessary, I'll just point out, that our galaxy itself is 100,000 light years wide. Light, which we understand to be traveling at the fastest speed possible, takes 100,000 years to get just simply across the Milky Way, let alone to anywhere else. And, you know, so that means that, uh, you know, light that we are seeing from the other side of the galaxy started its journey 90,000 years before humans started farming, right? Okay. There, how long did it take the light to get there from the photon's perspective? Well, an interesting question. And believe me, uh, we are almost immediately out of my depth um, mathematically and physically. I, I you know, to, to be yeah, honest. Well, he's I not, he doesn't have a bad, a bad misconception of it. And the idea is that if you can focus a, a, a number of your photons on another point in space time, uh, is from the photon's perspective is that those points are, are entangled and the pilot wave interpretation of the you know, Bohmian interpretation of quantum mechanics says that, that the, those waves travel forward and back in time and, and then, then decide which way to go. Um, so, uh, we, we are out of my depth, but let's just say, um, the, we can black box the question of how, and alien intelligence might have found itself in proximity to Earth, and we can put aside skepticism uh, with respect to whether or not they could be here at all, because there may or may not be mechanisms for crossing those large different distances on timescales that sound um, reasonable to us. And if they exist, then the things that are seen here on the Earth side of that journey are not likely, well, again, out of my depth, but are not likely to be whatever it is that crossed those large distances. They would be local transportation. Is that fair? Or am I just? Yeah, I think like within an atmosphere, maybe the long, the, the vast distances of space, if there's nothing in between, um, they might be able to do uh, some type of a warp drive where you are able to entangle to another point in space time and then shrink the distance between using uh, quantum entanglement. But the um, for at least short distances, there's plenty of other technologies that, you know, some of the stuff was in, discovered by Phil Brown effect, discovered in 1928 and was classified for 90, you know, eight, uh, 80 years. Uh, 2008, Obama declassified it along with a whole bunch of other stuff. And, it, and it, you know, very quietly, 
Um, turns out the B2 Spirit Bomber uses a, a version of this where they positively charge the front leading edge of the wing and, and negatively charge the exhaust stream. And it helps with um, lift as well and propulsion as well as the radar signature and invisibility um, of the craft. And uh, but this has been used for a number of years in, in programs, including, you know, by Ames Research Facilities, you know, in the 40s, when Brown was trying to sell this idea to the military and they told him he was crazy and that, and, you know, his idea was, was there was nothing to it. But meanwhile, Ames was went and stole the idea and was using it in the X-1 to um, positively charge that that nose cone, that needle on the front end of the wingtips and the, and the nose cone. And uh, when they positively charged that, it created this like ion cloud, which would uh, deflect the bow shock on, on the front end of the craft. So that when it went supersonic, it wouldn't rip apart. And it was a key component of uh, how they broke the sound barrier. And... It was it was Brown's technology, and then Brown came back again in the in the fifties, nineteen fifty six, with Andrew Bonson in North Carolina with Bonson Labs. So you know you have Bonson bringing Brown in, and uh, a number of other researchers came and visited, including you know Bryce and Cecil do it from the nearby University of North Carolina Chapel Hill, the father, the, the husband and wife team that um, your brother talks about. Um, on Joe Rogan and stuff. So, so there's a number of these cross pollinations. Uh, John Lear, uh, actually, John Lear Senior, was there in one of the one of the slides. That's uh, you know, John Lear's dad, who was the guy the, the CIA pilot who broke the story at Area 51, and basically was the I don't know, he's like the grandfather of the the Bob Lazar legend, in, in my opinion, which. That's a whole nother rabbit hole. <laughs> well, let, let's figure out how to address this. So, so sure. far, I think what we've concluded is um, there are superficial limits to travel over long distances. There's lots of reason to wonder if there might not be mechanisms that would bypass those limits. So uh, could there be an alien intelligence visiting the, our planet? There could be. We can't rule it out. Um, if there is, it is presumably either never was and it's recently arrived or is no longer interested in completely disguising its presence. So the question of the blind is the blind is lifted if what we are seeing that is being described as UAPs are in fact related to something extraterrestrial. Um, I, and you tell me if you share this, but I am uh, extremely skeptical of the direct observations of these very rapidly moving apparent aircraft within or craft within the atmosphere in large measure because they do not create the uh, sonic booms, for example, that one would expect when something moves faster than the speed of sound within an atmosphere as a result of uh, its impact on just the displacement of, of air. Um, and what wouldn't do that is a projection, let's just say from above maybe. If you had something projecting onto particles in the atmosphere, uh, you know, water particles, let's say. There's right. also laser-induced plasma effect, um, proton beam uh, that they can use, uh, anything that can excite. Um, they cross the beams, and the point the beams cross, if there's enough energy there where it actually can create like a plasma in the air. Um, and the plasma would allow you to project something? Is that the idea? So there's you can project, you can also dot matrix project like 3D images by, by patterning uh, where the dots, where the dots cross in the air. And okay. So to, to connect the dots for, for viewers and listeners, the idea is it is very technologically difficult to imagine craft that can move through the atmosphere at incredible speeds, even more difficult to imagine craft that can do that without creating sonic booms. What makes this much more tractable from both the perspective of the speed at which things travel and their failure to create the usual uh, sonic 
uh, consequences of a craft moving through the air would be something like a uh, laser pointer, right? If you put a laser pointer and you put the dot on the ground for your cat, there's no uh, meaningful limit to how quickly you can move it across the floor because a tiny movement of your fingers moves the thing feet. And so were somebody interested in projecting something that appeared to be an object onto something like plasma or water particles in the atmosphere or whatever it was, they could then move it incredibly rapidly. And the prediction of that hypothesis would be that it would not have sonic consequences, right? No, it would so not. That, yeah, you would, you would not have a sonic boom with that. And um, for, for the audience, if they want to look more into this, the technical term the military uses is ECCM or electronic counter countermeasure. And the term that um, uh, you can look up uh, to find the video on it is is con it's a Pentagon uh, talking plasma grenade or uh, talking Pentagon talking plasma balls should find a video on it. You can find um, some of the declassified videos on it, and and some of these declassified videos that other people are finding through FOIA are going back to some of these companies from you know twenty years ago you know, or longer that they may have had this. So you got to think in the, in the 1960s when they were developing lasers at Q division, which was a lot of the stuff that they did at Q division still classified. Um, what would be the first thing you did, you would do as a scientist after you built two lasers? <laughs> Cross the beam. Cross. Yeah, <laughs> sure. Um, okay. So let, let's now talk about things that don't fit this model. Okay. Um, I can think of a couple, you will know more if they exist. One is radar signatures. Um, and the other is I've seen one video, which I have to say at the level of the deep fakes of other things that I've seen, I can think of no obstacle you couldn't, no obstacle to faking this at a video level, but I've seen one instance where a craft appeared to have an impact on the water that it was traveling uh, slightly above. Now that yeah. is not predicted as far as I know by moving the equivalent of lasers uh, project images. Um, it could be a missile and uh, certain uh, the advanced missiles that they're building now, including torpedoes, um, employ a, a new type of technology called super cavitation. And the way that they do this is through a, a directed energy, um, actually, that they use like a, a, a focused maser that focuses um, a microwave that, that heats up air or water in a pocket um, at, a, at a target, at a focal point, a couple feet or inches, however long in front, with the, whatever they've calculated is the optimal focal point, but in front of the nose cone of, of the craft. And when they direct that energy there, um, the, it basically super cavitates the air or water in front of it, so it creates a vacuum uh, for the for the missile. It or whatever pulls the travel. missile forward, huh? It pulls the missile forward. It, it yeah, it pulls it can pull the missile forward, but it also it also eliminates the sonic boom because there it, it's it's crap. I, I don't I don't know that it, it makes a noise still, but it's not quite as loud as a sonic boom because of the how it, it it's eliminating the air, so the air doesn't it doesn't tear through the air and create the same turbulence effects afterwards. That I, I see. So if these were objects moving at high rates through the atmosphere, is it possible the sonic boom could be canceled? If you had this uh, type of super cavitating technology with these lasers, and uh, NASA did started developing this in the 1980s um, out of out of um, Rensselaer Polytech Institute uh, under a guy named Dr. Lake Marabu, L-E-I-K-M-Y-R-A-B-O, and he was the, the the head scientist on it and there's a number a number of other patents you can look up if you look up blasting air in front of hypersonic missiles got it that that will give you an article that you can find all the patents and and um stuff on, on the okay on the so um i think where we are is there's a lot about the modern observations of uaps that is most easily explained 
as projections that can move at an arbitrary velocity without displacing air. There are possibilities for how the natural consequences in air might be partially or completely canceled. Mm -hmm. So far, I haven't heard anything. I mean, I, you know, my cynical take as a... Can uh, I add a couple more things real sure. quick for the sure. people to, they can look up. Um, I interviewed a guy named T.D. Barnes. That's Theodore Barnes. He, he's the head of uh, special projects at Area 51 for about 40 years. He worked out there. Um, and he seems to think that all these pilots are seeing is, and I asked him this in the interview twice, he says that they're they're seeing our, our spoofing technology. It's it's our lasers and, and our ECCMs and and these capabilities that we have. What's an ECCM? That's the electronic counter countermeasure. And he in an interview um, also on the drive, he talks about Project Nemesis and Project Palladium, which is interesting because Project Palladium was uh, a system of these balloons with radar reflectors inside. So they were actually these pilots that were re reported lately seeing a, a cube inside of a sphere. It's mm. actually not a cube. It's actually an octagon, um, an octahedron inside of the uh, sphere. But the, the, um, the octahedron inside the sphere is, is in the patent from Project Palladium. And they go back to like 1947, the patents on these things that they've been building these and their radar reflectors and the radar reflectors are what is called drfm technology that's digital radio frequency memory now that's similar to what the stingray is um, that the fbi uses to to eavesdrop on people's cell phones it, it basically takes it takes the digital radio frequency signal from your cell phone copies it and then pretends to be the, or, or from the cell tower and then beams it and pretends to be the cell tower by copying this is the uh, the briefcase that they put somewhere that uh, allows them to intercept your transmissions without your it doesn't knowledge need to be a briefcase it can be it can, they can put it inside of a rock now oh a rock cool yeah. yeah i will tell you if they are listening um they gotta up their fucking game because my cell phone uh malfunctions at a rate that is unnatural and so if you're going to invade my privacy at least do it with quality tech so you don't disturb my ability to live a life that's just my editorial comment on that front um all right uh i, I disrupted your flow here no, that's fine, man. I was I was pretty much done after the balloons. Well, that's, so, that, uh, that's another. It, it, a lot of this is technology that people aren't aware of, and if they do the research, they're like, "Holy crap! You could you could literally fake all this stuff." But then the the UFO people are, get all mad at me because they're like, "Well, you're just like every every UFO case now. You can just explain it away as ter in terms of our technology. So what if aliens really do show up and and and, and you're just the, uh, over here saying it's laser beams and and uh, our tech yeah. and advanced drones that have hypersonic capabilities and you know. Well, I, I would push back on those people because a we are dealing with a scenario in which. If those things that people are observing are aliens who wish to be observed, they can settle the question any day they want to, right? right. right. Um, so you're either dealing with the aliens are ineffectively hiding themselves from us, um, or you're dealing with aliens who can settle the question. As far as the radar signatures, that's a more interesting answer than I was expecting. My sense was, you know, if the people who are doing the projecting maybe from space of what seem to be objects moving at improbable speeds without propulsion mechanisms through our atmosphere, uh, want to um, seed something into a radar that is not a natural consequence of the radar detecting something in the world, they could presumably do that too. But what you have proposed is that there are technologies which allow the projection of a phony radar signal, which makes perfect sense. I will tell you, I, uh, in my graduate work, I was a bat biologist. I worked on echolocating bats. I did not work on echolocation, but nonetheless, my, my bats uh, were echolocators. And there's always a question about whether or not an animal that has this capacity can um, put a signature in front of another animal, right? Like how sophisticated is this? And maybe in the case of bats, it's unlikely. Maybe it'd be more likely in the case of something like uh, you know, dolphins. Um, and, you know, to be honest, I don't, I don't know that there's any evidence that they can, but the possibility of it is something that's been on people's minds for many decades. 
Right. Well, we have acoustic metamaterial. So what if there's like a moth that has this the, a metamaterial um, of, of hairs on the or cilia on the back of its, you know, uh abdomen that that reflects the bats radar uh son, sonar it, signals or something you know well so. it it's actually very similar to uh you know you, you correct me if i'm wrong but uh, i used to lecture on this the the paint that is used on the stealth bombers and fighters yes. is um an extremely fragile material for exactly the same reason that moths are covered in this soft stuff which is radar absorbing um, and so, you know, there's all sorts of tricks that the uh, the stealth technology uses. One of them Powder. is that in, instead of being rounded, where there's always a tangent facing uh, the radar source, the you know because the angle of incidence equals the angle of reflection. If you make a faceted aircraft, then if you aim a beam of something at it, it tends to reflect off in a non-useful direction, yes. right? You have to sense That's from all over the place. But in addition, you cover the thing with something that is absorbent and much less of the energy gets reflected back at all. Um, yep. So once again, we have reproduced an insight that selection built into creatures um, before before we knew anything about it. Right. And and there's also, it's also responsible for the, the chitin on um, various uh, scarab beetles because there, there's ones that are silver there's ones that are emerald green there's ones that are gold um and that is all just a change of the permeability and permittivity of, of the of the chitin um ma manifolds and as a metamaterial essentially really? i did not i did not know that yeah uh, it's it's super interesting there's also a whole theory of that that they can be used the metamaterials can be used for anti-gravity so we have people that are experimenting with those as well uh, I don't really understand how anybody could be anti-gravity. My feeling no is no one's got anything to show. We've we've tried fifty. <laughs> we've had seventy plus years of everything that the government's tried. A lot of the declassified stuff going back to the you know the the fifties with um, Bonson Labs and Bifeld Brown effect, at, all the way to the you know eighties with um, David Alzafan and Boeing and this this idea that spin uh, tronics or NMR would have something to do with it. Um, but that actually started in 1946 with the discovery of nuclear magnetic resonance with Edward Mills Purcell, who actually headed the CIA's Project Rainbow, which was the CIA's study into that exact. They had the equation for radar reflection, and they said, how can we mi minimize you know, the radar return signal from these things? Or how can we, how can we use DR? The other solution was the DRFM technology that copies the radar signal and sends the, the spoof signal back with the, with the data that they want. Um, and that's more complicated. And it's interesting because that was developed at a place called Site 4 out at Tonopah Test Range during the 1980s is, is where they did all that. They had a big mock-up of the Soviet radar. They built rebuilt the Soviet radar system with their exact frequencies and everything and then figured out how to um, counter it. And that's the kind of stuff that they would they would do out there. And it's interesting that it was at a place called Site 4, because the only other place we found was a, a Site 4 where they built the B-2 Spirit Bomber at Plant 42 in Palmdale, which is um, – and the whole Site 4 that Bob Lazar talked about, I've never found any evidence for anything at Papoose Lake. In fact, it's a radioactive wasteland, that, and, there's, and, and it floods in the, in the wet season. So um, – it, it's it just it seems like a whole big deliberate misdirection um that is going on in the in the mainstream especially with, with what happened on joe rogan um the joe rogan podcasts where where they had uh he, he got really sucked into that whole bob lazar rabbit hole and never got never seemed to get out of it <laughs> you know yeah well um you know uh I find Joe an extremely reasonable guy. Um, and, you know, he says flat out that uh, he desperately wants the alien story to be true and that that clouds his judgment. I must say I also desperately want it to be true because not only would I be um, beyond fascinated as a biologist to have any insight into what life looks like elsewhere in the universe, but I also, as a humanitarian, believe that we are in 
very deep trouble with our technology and our rate of technological change. And it would be a godsend. Yeah. If we could get a piece of something, you know, well, if we could just, you know, to the extent that some alien race had found its way to earth, that means they've probably solved the basic game theoretic puzzles that seem to be putting us in such great danger. And if they, you know, let's put it this way, I'm willing to run the risk of an alien race that is not um, favorable towards earthlings. I find that unlikely. I think it's very unlikely that there would be anything um, to take from us that would be worth having. They might be fascinated by us as another example of life, um, and they might be interested in uh, you know, bringing us in on some of the deeper secrets of the universe so that we might survive the next 150 years. Um, I'm willing to take the risk of any of those possibilities because frankly, the danger we pose to ourself is now ourselves is now so great that, um, while I'm, I'm not giving up on us, I do think our best hope would be somebody who's figured out these answers, letting us in on them. It's, it's interesting. Um, I want to mention a couple things that relate to this. Uh, and, and I want to start with the, the, one of the last things that Bob Lazar said, he changed his story. Actually, he never said this before at the Joe Rogan podcast. Uh, I believe it was on where he said that he believes now that these things, if there's a hangar full of them, he thinks that they were from an archaeological find, that they were dug up. And I thought that was kind of interesting because, you know, one of the only cases from history that I think you can't explain with, you know, Chinese lanterns or some other types of Miss mis, uh, identification would be like the 1561 Nuremberg case where they they literally thought they saw a sky battle take place. And you have to wonder if there's like type three and two civilizations out there. Maybe there is a Star Wars type battles that have happened, and you know some of that stuff is debris that's floating around. It's, it's asteroids. Some maybe some of that stuff's fallen to Earth and landed. And and you, what would have happened over history if say you know some the roman army found something like this where would it where do you think it would be today and where it would have ended up it would have been deemed a holy relic and it would have been brought back to the church and it would have been locked away in the vatican basement vaults for eternity and that's where it would be today (laughs) yeah it's funny you know um this is this is almost the case with dinosaurs right right it was yeah that material has been near the surface you know, found presumably by many people over the course of history and prehistory, but nobody knew what to make of it, right? The discovery that, you know, what those creatures actually were is relatively recent. And so, um, yeah, you could imagine all kinds of misfiling of, of uh, materials that made no sense to the people who encountered them because, frankly, they didn't even know where they lived in the universe at the time. Um well, yeah, I, uh, certainly the, the the prevalence of dinosaur bones in the in the geological record is is um, something you know more that shows up a lot more than alien, alien um, debris or uh, you know spaceships parts from another galaxy or anything like that. It, it doesn't exist as far as we know. So, um, and if it did, it, it it's interesting that. I don't know where that material will be today, but there's a couple of people that claim to have pieces of this stuff, Gary Nolan for one and, and others. So, but all right. So uh, again, this would so, be, it would be nanotechnology. I, I, I would assume of, of a, you know, sophistication that would be beyond anything that we know. And again, I think that the coolest things I've seen is the, the idea of metamaterials and quasi crystals and the whole idea of photonic crystals and photonic circuits that we're getting to a point with our computer chips and our computer technology that we're going to be able to build, you know, 5d memory crystals and, and things that we're, our data storage capability is going to go through the roof and our computational power usage and also CPU size is going to, um, just be exponentially, uh, increased with the next gen once we make that leap from electronics to spintronic photonic devices. You mean CPU capacity will be increased? 
just the, the power usage that we have to use because you're, you're now you're pushing photons around which take a fraction of the energy it costs to push electrons around they don't produce nearly as much heat waste you know the resistance in, inside these phot you know photonic cavities and in, in computer uh, circuits would be astronomically lower than you know the copper wiring and other oh, yeah photons are light as hell yeah yeah all right that was a terrible pun. Uh, hopefully you'll forgive me and continue the conversation. <laughs> um, but okay. So let me just figure out, uh, where you live on this topic. All right. You believe that, uh, alien races are, uh, plausible. Yeah. That, Drake equation. It's almost certain that, that we're not alone. I yep, would say. I would agree. Um, that technologies, which might allow us to uh, bend space or to utilize entanglement in some way suggests that there probably isn't an actual bar to um, great civilizations separated by what seem to be large distances. Yes, be skeptical, but we also have to believe we have to like push this boundary, man. This is our, our, our civilization and our survival depends on it. Sure. Like, but, uh, but despite the fact that you believe those things, it sounds to me like what you've said is you don't believe you believe that this is more likely a psyop than uh, an actual visitation that we well, are. It would be the first time that they've done something like this. I mean, you look back to 1988 with UFO TV Live. They had this whole broadcast called with the aviary it was called where they brought out all these guys in cloak in cloak and dagger and didn't show their faces and had voice mods on them and we, of course we know all their names today and they've been associated with you know distant ufo disinformation and stuff like that um one of the guys is actually uh, owl from the aviary is was hal put off which is interesting and hal put off does have a, a history with psychological warfare operations he, he did that whole stint with the men at steric goats um with albert stubble bean and those guys at the um and, and the sub the book Psy Spies by Jim Mars. I read all about it. So he's got some interesting history, the stuff he did at SRI International, but he's also got some interesting physics and, and the whole idea of this polarizable vacuum approach to general relativity, where you can, if you change the permeability and permittivity of, of free space in between, you know, things, you, then you're, you're, you can warp that, those distances and perhaps those other, um, variables and, and change the, the laws of general relativity without, you know, violating Einstein, because um, that's a big no-no in, in physics. Um, so, so um, really interesting stuff that, in, in the literature there, but he, you know, don't know if he got that idea on his own, because he, he worked closely with a lot of other interesting fellows like um, Bernard Haish from Caltech, who was worked as a uh, st staff physicist for Lockheed Martin from 1979 to 1999, and did a lot of theoretical work for Lockheed Martin on these, you know, theoretical warp drives. You know, nineteen late in, in mid nineteen ninety four, I think nineteen ninety four is when Miguel Alcubierre published that warp drive paper, and the uh, the community kind of just went nuts. You know, so they were like, "Well, well, we're gonna have people looking into this," and they did. All right. Uh, so here's the question for you, though: You believe it is possible? that we have been or are being visited or will be, you do not buy, as I don't, the evidence that is on the table because it all seems to have a more rational explanation that is terrestrial. What have you seen that gives you pause, that makes you think, actually, that one might be more easily explained by aliens and their technology visiting the Earth? If there's nothing, there's nothing, but I'd be curious. If like, there's anything. Well, if it's, there's a couple ones, you just wonder if they're real or not. So certain, certain, you know, things, certain cases, you know, like there's one video that, that was supposedly um, recorded of a, a, a UFO flying over and, a, and it make and it instantly pr prints a crop circle in a field. And it was supposedly captured on like a, you know, a, a regular camera although this i don't I haven't seen the chain of evidence or any any of the proof for that because it really just looks like early you know 
advanced CGI or something that produces it. Yeah. Um, you know, certain it's very areas, hard to accept but, anything that's just pixels, you know? You know, I was super into this stuff early on when I first got into it. And I, I was convinced that it was not, you know, like that there might be, uh, you know, another cut. There was like another cover up. And, and I took that angle very strongly in a lot of the research that I did because, you know, people like Bob Lazar, who sent me down that rabbit hole, like they're hiding a hangar out in the desert with nine saucers in it. I mean, come on, that that, that that's enough to get anyone young kid interested in in <laughs> in this stuff and the, and the potentials that it might hold. And, you know, it's interesting when you start getting into the real physicists that, that didn't do, you know, work as senior staff physicists for, for Lockheed Martin. And you're like, wow, Lockheed Martin was looking into inertial, you know, control and also free energy systems and, and, and stuff like that. It's, it's, it's interesting. Um, but it's, it's more interesting, I find, than the fake stuff, which is, you know, the whole, you know, there's no proof for any of that. And the, the, the element 115 thing is like, you know, it was, a, I could just add numbers to the periodic table and guess element 120, some 29, 129, and, and say that it has anti-gravity. Where is it? It's been discovered It's and it's not stable in, in, anything more than you know a few milliseconds and it's not anti-gravity yet so we're still waiting and uh, the jury's still out and there's you know nasa studied field propulsion in 1979 uh, under you know alan holt and a number of uh, you know there's a number of other studies that you know you can look to and say like well they studied this stuff it, they reference nasa references uh, ufos as being an inspiration for why they did the study, you know, so obviously NASA scientists were taking some of this stuff seriously and trying to look into it and, and do research into it. But I haven't seen direct evidence of anything yet hard to, that that proves it. And then the physics that we do have that do look promising is, you know, things like um, laser etching, lithography of quantum dots you know laser etching quantum dots onto metal surfaces and and then layering these metamaterials um, that you can create from laser the laser etchings and the things that those will do and then also layered graphene with other types of uh, you know borophene and other types of um, interesting two to two dimensional materials uh, create some really interesting effects that um, we'd really like to study more but Again, these things are super expensive to, 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 to play with, basically. Well, my understanding is that is changing. Uh, Jim Tor's lab seems to have come up with a inexpensive process for mass producing uh, graphene in a useful form. Um, so, and, you know, uh, I actually know Jim a little bit and uh, I have nothing but respect for the guy's capacity in the realm of nanotech. It's incredible. Um, so anyway, there's no doubt we are on the verge of many a material revolution where, you know, tiny amounts of matter can be arranged in ways that have extraordinary properties and presumably any sufficiently advanced uh, race elsewhere in the universe would have um, encountered those things and leveraged them in all kinds of ways that are hard for us to imagine. So, um, but I want to go back because you described something fascinating here, which, you know, uh, strengthens my sense about who you are and why I would listen to you on a topic like this. You describe yourself as um, more credulous uh, with respect to the visitation of earth by aliens earlier and the more you've studied and learned the less you are convinced that the evidence that they have been here exists you haven't seen anything that compels you i think that that's a very powerful story for somebody who believes that it is readily possible to have convinced themselves out rather than convinced yourself into the idea that it has happened or is happening um, you've gone the other direction, and that's exactly what I would want to see. I would want to see the scientific skepticism cause you to, in so, fact, realize uh, that there's a more likely explanation for what we have so far seen. 
So you want to get into why I got to that position or the best, and I'll, I'll cap it off with the best evidence that I've actually seen so far through my study of, of you know, trying to prove this out and, you know, everything is. Yep. So, yeah, I, the thing is, it's, it's, you get burnout because you, you, if you really believe too much in a case and then you find out you start digging more and more and eventually it loses its footing. You know, you debate with, you debate it with enough skeptics that you realize that you learn more about the case as you debate it with more and more people and, and, um, engage more with skeptics. Like you can't just sit in an echo chamber and, uh, with a bunch of people who agree with you and uh, you'll never get really anywhere. And, and even if you do, what's the point? Um, because you're just, you're just staying inside of a closed hole. Uh, so that kind of got, me out of that. And I, I realized pretty early on that technology was the way out of all of this stuff and the science really proving it out. If you can you know, do an experiment, you know, if, if, the, if you're saying that you have a technology which can um, turn steel into dust, then show me and demonstrate it, you know, um, build it and then, then show me how to do it and, and how much energy it uses and, and all the, and everything else. And, um, you know, and then we can do it. We can go from there, you know, or show me anti-gravity. So, yeah. So we have 70 plus years of the government studying this stuff. And I've, I have a massive archive that we've assembled of all the, the different studies, but, you know, after two years of doing APEC and, you know, getting guys like Ryan, Ronald Evans on from project green glow over in the UK, he was on BBC like a week after he presented on, on our show and, uh, basically gave the whole gave like the real deep you know this wasn't like the bbc's 10 minute video coverage on it he presented for an hour and then submitted to an hour q a where we just grilled the guy on you know asked him anything we wanted about this this program that he worked on um at over at um britain's area 51 important down um really interesting stuff and, they, and they, they're doing some really cool research over there they have a super sensitive um quantum gradiometer gravitometer uh it's called it, it measures quantum gravity it basically just detect any little disturbance so if ufos are flying around it will be able to detect them um but not the first time again that that what you find is that there's counterintelligence that have seeped in and done things like the aviary that i talked about one of those guys was a guy named richard doty and there's a documentary I think anyone who gets into UFOs should watch. It's called Mirage Men. And it's the story of this guy named Paul Benowitz, who was an amateur uh, radio operator um, and had a bunch of radio equipment too close to um, an NSA surveillance operation and, and something that they were – some top secret programs that they were running out of uh, – um, what's the name of the air force base down in new mexico there um anyways uh he was stumbled upon this and got a little too close to it and so they have signed this u.s air force osi office of special investigations agent richard doty to the case and planted doty befriended him and then plant it was started planting stuff they started beaming radio signals into his stuff and made him feel like that he had stumbled across the alien operation and that it was the NSA talking to aliens. And it was this big thing. And, 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 and it made the guy go crazy. Actually, Paul, Paul Benowitz, the true story. And he actually committed suicide because of all of it. And, and even after like they had thrown him off the trail of it, when he was going off the deep end, they, they had tried, Doty said he had tried to approach him and, and, and tell him the truth. And he didn't want to believe it. He was so deep into the rabbit hole at that point. He didn't want to believe that. You know, he, he, he wanted to believe the, that he had stumbled across this big alien thing rather than it was a, you know, a top secret, you know, Air Force project that they were and that they were trying to throw him off the case. And and then it talks about other operations like Project Plowshare was one where they were doing underground nuclear testing. And then they wanted to monitor some of the radiation effects in the down downstream um, river systems and, and ta neighboring towns and cities. And what they were doing to do that is you know, sampling some of the local livestock like cattle, and they were removing the thyroid glands from the cattle because, of course, thyroid has um, 
iodine uptake. Uh -huh. So when you, there's radioactive iodine in the environment from the, you know, off stream from this nuke test, it's going to get picked up by your thyroid gland. And so that's going to, that's going to be the place they're going to be able to detect it. And, and um, so they were basically, the military was taking people's livestock, cutting out the thyroid glands, <laughs> and then to throw them off this trail, they were, you know, cutting out other organs and dropping them from helicopters and doing, and sucking all the blood out and doing all this weird stuff. Um, to throw them off the trail of what they're really after the thyroid glands for the radioactive iodine, but uh, they were doing all this weird stuff and blaming it on aliens so that they didn't have to pay the farmers for their cattle. So question about that. Um, the radioactive iodine has a very short half-life. I think it's yeah. eight days or something like that. So they were doing this in the immediate aftermath of their underground tests? Yeah. They were huh. testing and, and then they were blame they were doing the cattle mutilations to blame it on aliens and because because some of the local farmers were getting suspicious and they were trying to throw them off the trail apparently so this is like a, and then of course that you take the other side of this you know the the play devil's advocate uh you know or conspiracies advocate and say oh well maybe the government created this explanation just to cover up the aliens doing this and right you know, <laughs> yeah, I mean, and, and this is one of the problems with a landscape of secrecy is that it actually throws a monkey wrench into the normal use of Occam's razor, right? Because <laughs> anytime you have something in which a cover up is an actual functional piece of the thing, what is a cover up? Well, a cover up is something that attempts to create the impression of the way some dots should be connected that isn't right. the correct way to connect them. And so anyway, again, this is why I have appreciated your work for many years is that you, you know, my own feeling is Occam's razor works even when you're dealing with conspiratorial stuff, but it only works when you have all of the information, when you have a subset, especially a curated subset of the information, you have to be ready to see a violation of Occam's razor and realize that, you know, that, you know, you're missing, you're missing evidence. Um, and so anyway, yeah, w w where's the cover it goes up? way beyond that, beyond Occam's razor when you deal with a cover up, because what you have is a, an, an institution which has control of 90% of the mainstream media where they can direct a message, create a, a false movement, um, prop up their fake, fake leaders of this false movement, lead an entire movement in the wrong direction. Um, ask and if because you know you go back to um, you know Thomas Pynchon's uh, to quote Thomas Pynchon in Gravity's Rainbow if they can get you asking the wrong questions they don't have to worry about the answers mm. and that that's the whole concept of the game here is that they create a false they prop up all these know nothings with the misinformation. So that they can put those front and center, create this movement, you know, attitude that we're going to knock down the doors and, and, and get the answers to all this stuff. But they ask the wrong questions and then it, and then it gets debunked and then everyone loses hope and goes home and says, you know, like, oh, maybe this was there's nothing to this. And then if there is programs there, they're not they're not getting talked about and they're also hyping everyone up about that it's aliens and that we need to, you know, get the government to disclose the truth, you know, to bring out the saucers and the aliens and, and, and to bring it up. But what if that's not the case? I don't, we don't have a, a ton of, we have some interesting circumstantial evidence for that, but we don't have any direct evidence. So the circumstantial evidence is, is kind of interesting. You have this, uh, it, well, one is you have this repeat event uh, of, um, the balloons over Super Bowl weekend and they all get shot down you know, blown out of the sky with sidewinder missiles so that there's nothing left. And then they can say like, oh, they vanished without a trace and and we don't have anything left to do it. But it was all, you know, spy balloons and these advanced balloon technology. And that's, of course, a repeat of, you know, Roswell, which they blame the whole thing with uh, the Alvarez, uh, you know, Alvarez, the scientist who did all the Project Mogul balloon experiments for the, you know, U.S. military at the time. You know, coming out and saying this was all part of a really big uh, weather balloon train and, and radar reflectors that we were using to track, you know, dop, you know, to do Doppler patterns in the clouds to, to measure the wind patterns with the with these balloons, and um, 
you know, this was all part of, uh, you know, our operation. And some of them might have been spy balloons, too, that we were sending o- over as well, even early back then. And that was the whole cover up for Roswell, apparently. But and then you have things like von Neumann in October, uh, you know, the, one of the top Manhattan Project scientists, uh, the, the the brain of, of the Manhattan Project, essentially. Um, and he comes up with the idea of von uh, von Neumann probes, which are uh, self-replicating space probes, probes that can go out and make copies of themselves and then go out and colonate the galaxy and make more copies and then share and send information um, back and forth. It's essentially like the a type three, what we call type three Kardashev now. Um, now, did he just hear the rumors about Roswell and the alien crash saucer and come up with the idea on his own, just in his own brain, or did he see something and came up with that idea from that? Well, it's, it's arguable. I, I say both ways. Um, now, the legend goes that whatever they recovered at, at Roswell, um, the Air Force intelligence officer on the scene, Jesse Marcel, later testified that there was a debris switch and that it was not of this earth, which started a lot of these conspiracy theories and rumors. And of course, we know that the debris went to right Fort Pat, um, uh, Fort Worth first, went to Fort Worth, Texas from Roswell, which was the, the division, the head of the first army um, division. And then from there, Ramey took the press uh, photo with it in the press conference saying it was just a weather balloon. And from there, apparently, that was, that was where the debris switch took place and that the real material went to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base on another flight. Um, and that it was received at Wright-Patterson and stored in a place, um, I don't know if it was Hangar 18 at Wright-Patterson. I think it was Hangar 18 at, at the first, um, at Roswell. Um, I'm getting the date, the, the de- important details mixed up, but interesting that um, in 1949, um, Battelle Memorial Institute, which is in Columbus, Ohio, which is 45 minutes from Dayton, Ohio, where Wright Patterson is, they did a study um, into the metallurgy of night and all, um, basically nickel nickel alloys they were looking into titanium alloys sorry titanium alloys and they had a whole bunch of different titan different titanium alloys but the focus on nickel alloys was like three pages um when the other ones were just a page each and so they were really looking at nickel titanium alloys back then in 1949 for some reason and this was of course a decade before nitinol wire was discovered at naval ordnance research laboratories and one of the interesting things about the, the Roswell debris that all these witnesses, if you go back to the original witness testimony, they described this memory foil of this this memory metal um, that was a woven. And they said they said people who worked with this stuff said that they, it was like a woven mesh fabric uh, on the quantum level, and that's why they said that that it couldn't have been man made back then. It was just way too complex of a material and. No one's ever been able to reproduce a piece of that material or, or, or show that it's real. But I think the stories of it were interesting enough to, to wonder why, you know, they were looking into ways to apparently you couldn't cut or break the stuff. It was really, really hard and, and, um, and really durable. And so right in this Battelle study, they have the scientists working on this, um, carbon tetrachloride method where they dissolve this stuff and, and, and um, chlorine, uh, carbon tetrachloride, um, and then measure the off gases to determine the composition. So they have these real ways of really complex ways of analyzing substances that would might might be indestructible, so to speak, in in 1949, which is interesting. Um, but it, most interesting thing is that was the, the, the research was uh, under the director of this guy, Howard C. Cross, who came up in this Pentacle Memorandum that was found in J. Allen Hynek's notes. J. Allen Hynek was the scientist that the U.S. Air Force hired to uh, head the Project Blue Book investigation from you know, 1958, I think, till 68, um, maybe 55. It was 
if I'm, if I'm correct. Um, I might be getting the dates wrong, but yeah, the Project Blue Book study, apparently there was two Project Blue Books. There was a second Project Blue Book, which dealt with this metallurgy side of, of actual, had access to actual materials. And that was directed by Howard C. Cross of Patel. And there were a number of other interesting names on that list who I've never been able to really track down and, and find any solid information on the uh, on any of those people um, looking through just conventional records. If there's records on them, it's at Patel or somewhere else um, or whoever was involved in it. But I thought that was interesting um, because if there was a, an operation, Patel would be the place that would do it. It's, it's a quasi-governmental organization. It's... Um, you know, what Edgar Mitchell described of where these things were held um, in, in an interview, he, he apparently knew some, something about it, or Gordon Cooper, I'm not sure which one of them. But anyways, Battelle is an interesting, an interesting organization because it manages all of our national labs. So Los Alamos, um, Oak Ridge, they're all under the management directorship of Battelle. So if you want to control science in this country, um, you could do it easily through a quasi-governmental organization like Battelle. They would have the power and leverage to be able to, you know, cover up um, a UFO thing or hold on, be a container, so to speak, for, for um, a UFO file or something like of this nature, if, the, if it exists. If there's a, and the other uh, um, container that we know of that may have existed was actually uncovered by a Senator Barry Goldwater. I who um, was told about this, um, it was a, allegedly a blue a, a blue room, it's called the Blue Room at Wright-Patterson, and that the Blue Room is where they store um, all the artifacts of unknown origin, apparently, whether that's Russian or Chinese or, or what have you. Um, so there's, you know, there's speculation about that. You know, I don't know for sure. I, I, I'm curious. I certainly like to believe that there's a blue room and that they have pieces of alien technology in there that, you know, they're not releasing to the public because, you know, what happens when, you know, uh, what happens when Al Qaeda gets a hold of free energy technology? You know, it's an and anti gravity and warp drive. It's, it's not going to be pretty. So it, it, I, I can understand why they, they may want to keep that stuff classified if it if it does exist um, but at the same time if if we had all if everyone had it and and they just you know i don't know at the same time i think that if, even if they did release it the, the material science end of this is sufficiently so far advanced that it sets a high enough bar that you can't really reach that bar without um, some serious international collaboration so I, I really doubt that if they did disclose it or release it release it that a, a rogue group would be even be able to like even mao tse tung you know wouldn't be able to i mean uh, even you know, Kim Jong Un wouldn't be able to, you know, build this stuff without, you know, some serious collaboration. I think it's going to take a, a serious international collaboration and effort to to um, develop photonics technology and warp drive technology and all and this next revolution in, in science and, and physics that's coming. So again, um, just to be just to be clear, what you're saying <laughs> is there may or may not be a blue room. It may or may not contain alien tech. So far, there's no reason to believe that it does that you have seen. Um, but if it did, there would be the expectation that it. You you offer a more generous interpretation of why it would not be shared. Um, my sense is that it, given the levels of governmental corruption that we have now seen, it is hard for me to imagine uh, that the first instinct of at least some of the people who would have had access wouldn't be to privatize it for uh, their own profit, uh, which would then necessitate a cover story of why it wasn't being shared. Um, but right, this is the plot to all the um, Disney's Witch Mountain films, where it's always some rich billionaire that wants to get a hold of the, that technology and, and leverage it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would agree. Yeah. All right. Um. Well, that's all, all very interesting and uh, matches my own sense. I have yet to see the thing that will cause me to jump 
Well, the other thing, right, is, is is that the people that they put in charge of, of these things are very often uber religious, you know, Christian types who are, who, and they convince them that, that this is demons, you know, so they have to lock these demons away from, you know, normal societies. And, and this is sort of the, they use a religious philosophy, I think, in some of the, um, in some of these institutions to keep this, because it seems like a lot of the people who I've seen are, are these people that are convinced that it's demons and, or, you know, and, and that's their interpretation of it. They don't want to go beyond that. And, and, uh, they're happy with that explanation. And, uh, but, you know, again, I think, I seem to think that anything outside of, uh, the belief system of, um, dogma or official, you know, dumb is, is deemed demons in, in this day and age or conspiracy theory, what have well, you. Well, actually, but, that brings me to something I wanted to recover from something you said earlier in the podcast. Uh, and forgive me, it's now been long enough. I, it's going to be hard for me to recover exactly what you said, but yeah. we were talking about the, um, the mixture, the, you know, the getting people to ask the wrong questions. Mm-hmm. And what I have seen, you know, if I look out at um, the, the intellectuals of the day, many of them seem to have a smug and at the same time, I think completely inexplicable belief that conspiracies are not worth worrying about. And many of them have a rationalization for why you don't have to worry about them. You know, they're rare, and so there's some sort of percentage argument. I don't know. But the whole thing strikes me as the product of a psychological operation. That in effect, if what you did is, you know, first of all, I think those who conspire at a sophisticated level have learned certain tricks. One of them is that you release real information fused with garbage. Yeah. And what this does is it produces a uh, an experience that is near universal, where people who begin to follow one of these rabbit holes because there's something real to be discovered embrace some piece of garbage, they get burned, and it's basically like a dog being swatted on the nose with a newspaper every time it, you know, puts its its snout somewhere. They learn not to do it. And so the basic point is, why would intellectuals who know full well that conspiracies have been a permanent feature of history uh, from the beginning, why would they embrace a position that is in effect a non-starter, conspiracies aren't worth worrying about, um, if that makes no sense. Well, because they're behaving like dogs who every time they've uh, contemplated a conspiracy have had their nose swatted, and so they yeah. learn not to do it, and they're now explaining to themselves why it's not worth doing, um, which is very destructive because, of course, it fosters conspiracy. It creates a cloak for it in which it can operate well, what we've seen during COVID is we've seen conspiracies operating almost in plain sight, right? Conspiracies to suppress information, conspiracies to shape people's uh, understanding, to exploit their fears. And even the revelation of it doesn't cause it to break and cause us to, you know, pursue an explanation of who did it and why and what their real motives might have been. Um, so anyway, I'm, I'm looking at a population that looks like it was trained not to ask the right questions, which dovetails very well with what you had uh, put on the table. Yeah, it's it's also funny because who are they asking the questions to? Because the ultimate, um, uh, to quote Robbie Graham, the ultimate irony of the disclosure movement is that it deeply distrusts officialdom while simultaneously looking to officialdom for the truth. And by imagining all answers to the UFO mystery to be out of public reach, deep in the bowels of the national security state, the disclosure movement actually places power into the hands of officialdom while disempowering the individual. And I think that's a, that's profound because who does the military look to when they need answers? Well, they well for Project Blue Book, they hired who? J. Allen Hynek. Who was J. Allen Hynek? He was a scientist. <laughs> This guy like me who was like, I'm super interested in UFOs, and I've already studied this, um, you know, a de- for a decade more without pay, and I'd be happy to study it for the government, you know, with pay, if uh, if I could just get, you know, 
<laughs> if I just knew the right people, I guess. <laughs> well, well, I've wondered about this from a different perspective. You know, I wonder why there aren't, maybe there are, and I'm just not aware of them, but it seems to me that the idea of, you know, demanding that the government cough up the information about the aliens uh, ought to be coupled with an at, at least as uh, prominent an impulse to just contact the aliens directly. Like, why are people not bypassing the government and saying, actually, you can't trust those people. Um, why don't you come talk to some folks who are actually up to the challenge? Why is there no sci private scientific institute with a beam that it's pointing up into the, you know, into the sky with an invitation to actually talk science and uh, help humanity out of its mess? Right. We could go to the very large array down in uh, New Mexico where, the, you know, the big satellite, uh, radio satellite telescope array and uh, just set up a beam in the center of that thing with a landing pad. And, and, and uh, it would be like, you know, contact SETI. And, yeah. How about and, even just help? Yeah. We could use some help. We're at that stage of history that undoubtedly, if yes. you exist, you know happens where we are a huge danger to ourselves and our Save leadership our is not soul. up to the challenge. You would think um, that we could at least put out, you know, it would be inexpensive to invite the aliens who very well may not exist uh, in near proximity at all. But if they do, you know, why do, why are we trusting the governments to talk to them. I don't trust the governments to do anything else at this point. I've seen too much. You know? Yeah, why would we trust them at all? In fact, if if it came out and the governments admitted to this or said anything about it, I would distrust that <laughs> immediately. Right and where I am. You know, so. <laughs> yeah, I would distrust it immediately. Exactly. The aliens are suffering from the distrustworthiness of government, uh, which might be impacting their ability to actually talk to some of us folks down here who... Um, uh, would be in a better position to do it well. I just, I'm just astounded by the the people that the two individuals that the Pentagon put in front of Congress for those hearings and and how just clueless they were and underprepared of and and I feel like the whole thing is a set up misdirection where they they can get they can post up their false front. Um, and again, this is like the idea of uh, the pseudo gang. It's called, um, you know, like in if you watch Life of Brian, where they had the Judean People's Front and then the People's Front of Judea, where they create this counter organization of a similar name, and and you pretend to be the original organization, and then cause a bunch of trouble so that everyone hates your organization by, uh, you know, it, and that's the idea is that they can create, they can put a bunch of. Um, crap out there with fake scientists, fake whistleblowers, and fake videos, get it all debunked where they can introduce this video and, and, and say, and then, then it gets debunked where they can literally find the star pattern in the charts and say, look, look, it's a, it's a triangular aperture lens. It's creating the bokeh effect and you're not admitting to this. And, and yet he's still trying to hammer down that door. It, that's a psyop. That's a psyop because we have such better evidence. Anyone who wants to look into this thing a little bit could find that and know much better questions to ask. But when these are the people that are leading it and the and the information that's being you know presented, um, it, you're not going to get the any answers. Or you, the answers you're going to get are going to be the wrong ones. And it's and uh, I think that there's a lot of that going on uh, right now with regards to this because. There is credible information that, at least from what I found, for what we're working on, that we're the public's not being told about, and I think it's more important what's not being talked about than what is, and in, in, in with regards to this subject. So, yeah, that's that's fascinating. Unfortunately, I have seen that pattern uh, with COVID, where the they create a bunch of fake doctors, right? And then they'll create these fake PhD profiles on Twitter and you'll follow them thinking it's real information and then they'll start inserting a lot of bad information with it. I saw well, that a lot. That's, that's certainly true. Something has created false profiles. But even worse, there are, you know, there is a discussion of people who have decided to pay the price of not staying on narrative. And that discussion has disagreement within it. And then there's the official discussion, which pretends to have disagreement 
within it over questions that are effectively settled. I mean, why are we still, I mean, look, you can take your kid and you can get them an mRNA vaccine for COVID. That doesn't make any sense, right? The fact that the current version of COVID isn't especially threatening, that it doesn't threaten children, that we do have adverse events. It doesn't, there is no rational argument for that. And yet what we have in the doctor's office and in the halls of Congress and everywhere else is the pretense that there is a rational argument, which it's hard to even imagine what it would sound like, right? We're just, there's too much evidence now that that argument is dead in the water. And yet, you know, actual needles are being put into actual arms that they should never be. Um, so anyway, there's something about the way, the degree to which officialdom is willing to pretend that an argument is viable. You know, in the case of the UAPs, you're describing people who um, aren't expert being questioned as if they were and revealing themselves to be foolish. But the point is, as you say, that is the diagnosis of a psyop, right? That well, the purpose of such a thing, the purpose of querying people who are not experts is to be the public. There's many different types of psyops. So like this bait and switch where they, you know, you bait them with what they think is, you know, the golden whistleblower, but you switch it out for a fake. Then there's the straw man where you're presenting this as like, well, this is a UFO researcher and or this is a this is a conspiracy theorist and this is what they believe where you, you, you create a straw man version of that, then you can debunk the straw man where you, you can keep those arguments in within a context where you can actually, you know, debate them. Like, I don't know, I can go into many examples, but I don't know. Well, I mean, look, I, I do think uh, before we close this discussion out, uh, it is worth saying, I first became aware of you not in the... UFO, UAP context. But I first became aware of you in the context of conspiracy, I would call them hypotheses. I think we do ourselves a disservice to refer to them as conspiracy theories, that that's in fact part of the psyop that causes us to look away. But in any case, um, there are many conspiracies. We have to be forever vigilant because the incentive for people to conspire and uh, take advantage of us is... It's not going anywhere. Um, that said, the majority of hypotheses in the area of conspiracy are simply wrong. And so what one needs is a toolkit for searching that landscape for um, useful information without falling victim to either a reflexive embrace of conspiracies or equally as bad, a reflexive rejection of the idea of conspiracy, which may solve the problem of, you know, you looking good to your friends at the cocktail party, but it puts us all in much greater danger of actual conspiracies um, succeeding. And so the question is, how does one address that? And my, from before I uh, had discovered your work, uh, I had concluded that the right toolkit with science, that one has to be aware you don't have all the information and one has to navigate very cautiously. But nonetheless, you can, for example, study the- Not just that, but you also have to be aware that someone is tr actively trying to hide the real information from you and present the, the narrative that's being presented in the mainstream public, I almost like immediately assume is false always because if that's what's always being put out there it's the cover story and the real information is always being actively hidden and i find that in search engine that one of the biggest tool toolkits i can tell people is I, I i use yahoo video search now because it, it it's like the back end algorithm for how youtube search algorithm used to work before they fixed it so that you can no longer find what you're looking for if this if it's a conspiracy like what i swear like they have like a tag on real information um <laughs> the if you start talking about real information on your video it just doesn't it doesn't show up in the searches anymore <laughs> oh believe me i uh our channel has uh clearly been flagged in a way number absolutely i watched i watched it you you guys were like getting twice the views on the live streams and 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 then 
Yeah, and then they, they've created the the doldrums, whether that's actual, whether they actually are hiding us from the public or whether they are uh, pretending that we're reaching fewer people in order to dissuade advertisers. Right. I don't know what they're doing, but um, it is clear that, you know, it's more than a thumb on the scale. It's a freaking elephant on the scale. Um, and, you know, it has its impact, which hasn't changed what we do, but um, but nonetheless, it does exist. It's part of some mechanism to prevent certain things from being discussed in the places where they can be heard. Um, but that does raise a question. I, I do want to talk to you about the fact of the desperate need, I would say, the vacuum of people who responsibly deal with questions of collusion, um, something that I think you do exceedingly well. I don't know what the ratio is between conspiracies that you have concluded are real and uh, conspiracies that you have debunked, but you have certainly debunked far more uh, conspiratorial ideas than you have embraced. It shows the same skeptical instinct that people have seen in this podcast with respect to UAPs. I mean, you, you call yourself alien scientist. You're certainly uh, open to and excited for the idea of alien contact, but it doesn't cause you to embrace things that are not supported by evidence, right? So in any case, do you want to say anything about um, how you have engaged questions of conspiracy and, and what you've learned about that general topic? Well, uh, it's certainly interesting to see the change in a lot of, you know, cause I had a lot of family members and friends that had, you know, for years said, you know, you're going, you're like crazy. Some of the stuff you talk about and everything. And in the last two years, uh, I've had so many people like come back and say, you know what, you you were like, I'm start, I'm going to start listening to you now because you, everything you've been calling, it's like, yeah, it's like I have a, I can predict the future or something because it's, you know, I'm saying that you know, you have a group of people that I've been watching that have done a lot of things that are connected to, and a lot of these pieces are connected. Uh, you know, let's talk about. Iran Contra scandal, for example, right? Uh, the closing statement that Daniel Inouye, the senator from Hawaii, um, said at the, the end of the Iran Contra hearings is that there exists a shadowy government with its own air force, its own navy, its own fundraising mechanisms, and the ability to pursue its own ideas of the national interest free from all checks and balances and free from the law itself. When you look into the group that was connected to Iran Contra, and you realize that you, and you start tracing these people through, a lot of bad this it's a bad apples group, and this is a it's parts of the agencies that have gone rogue over the years and were never reeled back in. There's they've they've gone really rogue and and been involved in a, a whole host of of nasty and uh, really devious things. And, and um, now we are talking about something that must have been passed from one generation of rogue entities to another, right? We have, I mean, this is one of the things that is always the most troubling. It's, it's hard to detect, but the most troubling thing in the landscape of responsible conspiracy hypothesis testing Mm -hmm. is that you find that things like the Kennedy assassination are connected in strange ways to things like the Watergate break-in. Yes, yes. Right? The that, break yes, Frank Sturgis and E. Howard Hunt. And uh, the, they were like the, they looked just like the, uh, the tramps that were arrested in Dealey Plaza and later released. They were found in a train car. And then E. Howard Hunt on his deathbed said he was a, you know, bench warmer on the assassination and, and details like that. And then E. Howard Hunt's lawyer saying that, oh, what's the big picture? And that him ha saying that E. Howard Hunt told his lawyer that it was, uh, that they're hiding alien technology. That was another interesting uh, thing that came out of E. Howard Hunt's lawyer, that the big thing that, that this is all about is that, you know, he was going to blab, JFK was going to blab about the alien technology, apparently, and that he had told Marilyn Monroe about it. 
and that Marilyn Monroe was assassinated along with her girlfriend, Dorothy Kilgallen, who was the newspaper reporter that was writing uh, her last interview that she did was with Jack Ruby. Wait, what? Dorothy Kilgallen, her last interview that she did was with Jack Ruby. It never got published and she, and she wound up dead before huh. it got published. All right. Well, that's a connection I didn't know. Um, yeah. So, <laughs> but I didn't know about, uh, E. Howard Hunt and the hobos arrested, uh, outside of Dealey Plaza. Yeah. The tramps, uh, there's a, there's a interesting suspects. They look like some CIA guys that were dressed like hobos and, um, certainly bear a resemblance to, uh, uh, Frank Sturgis, E. Howard Hunt, and I think Gary Campbell. Uh, Campbell um, was the right. other guy. And of course, the fact that people bear a resemblance doesn't tell you anything. Uh, no, there's been a lot of misidentifications, and other people like say it was Chauncey Holt and 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 another other, a number of other people that have. Uh, Woody Harrelson's dad said he's at one point was uh, an allegation of that. But there's there's also, yeah, you look at the photography and the stuff that people have pulled out of there, like the the Mary Mormon photograph and the badge man, you know, there's the whole theory that it was a Dallas police officer, uh, 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 one of the Dallas police officers on the grassy knoll that took the shot. But what, what we can say for factually certain is that in the investigation of Watergate, um, the assassination of JFK is mentioned as if there is a connection and there is a effort to obscure it. And in other words, that that avenue is not taken. We do not find out what the connection is. Yeah, that was uh, from the the uh, Nixon tapes, right? Where he talks about the whole Bay of Pigs thing and says we better not get into that. Yeah, yeah. And the Bay of Bay of Pigs thing was the Kennedy assassination, of course. The Bay of Pigs was uh, uh, nicknamed Operation Zapata. Yep. And Zapata I thought oil. Interesting. Zapata Oil Company was George H. W. Bush's company, and. Um, they had used the platforms, the Scorpion platform, as the staging operation for the Bay of Pigs invasion. And um, that's why it was nicknamed Operation Zapata. Well, back to the whole issue of the Dallas police force, though, is a lot of the Dallas police officers used to hang out at Jack Ruby's club, the Carousel Club in, 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 um, in Dallas, apparently. And one of them, uh, the guy was a guy named Roscoe White, who looked just like JFK. Um, no, wait, no, wait. Tippett was the one that looked Tippett like JFK. Like JFK, yeah. The one that got shot. He looked like JFK, and they, there's a conspiracy that he was the body double and that they needed to make fact, him the body double. Was his, am I incorrect that his nickname was, was JFK? Yeah. JFK. He looked so much like him. Um, yeah. But one of the other police officers was Roscoe White, and Roscoe White was in the Civil Air Patrol, and he was a platoon buddy with. Lee Harvey Oswald, and he was also in the Marines at stationed at Atsugi Air Force Base, which is where the U-2 spy plane flights were, were flown out of. There's all these interesting connections. Um, one, uh, you got to read Crossfire by Jim Mars. Um, it was a really good, real good early book on it. And also Family of Secrets by Russ Baker. He, he, was, uh, he really nailed down a lot of uh, other interesting connections on, on the whole JFK assassination for me, where I was just like, you know, this is just too deep. And the fact that it's, we're here 70 years later and they still won't release the files on George Joannides. Um, and that's just, that's just suspect right there. Um, and the whole yep. issue with George Joannides, apparently he was at the Ambassador Hotel the night that RFK was assassinated too, alongside David Sanchez Morales and um, Gor Gordon Campbell. So yep, the uh, that's the thing is they have uh, effectively trained people not to go down these rabbit holes because if you go down these rabbit holes, you do find the number of connections is improbably large. Um, it's it's really quite remarkable. But actually, okay, now that we've both um, taken the risk of exposing that we are not um, we are not of the mindset that conspiracies are so unlikely to occur that we won't entertain them, right? Some people will view that as an indictment of our capacity to think. And I would just, I would ask you this. Um, yeah. I'd you, ask them, maybe you can ask them to debate me and you could host it. <laughs> I, I was I was thinking along the same lines. Um, 
you be willing, I know that you have offered in the past, but you're still willing to debate um, conspiracy skeptics? Yeah, absolutely. Um, So I happen, I'm friends with Michael Shermer. I quite like him. Um, Yeah, he's... He's a skeptic on on uh, all of these uh, conspiratorial topics. You'd be willing to debate him on Dark Horse? Yeah, absolutely. I, I went on Mick West's show um, two years ago. I maybe I should uh, get Mick West and, and do a, a re uh, a revisit of his show at some point too. Man, I, I, I that's 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 a good idea. Okay. Well, cool. I I would love to see it. Um, frankly, I think. The place that we are with respect to collusion is very unhealthy. You cannot have a functional, complex society uh, like ours and reflexively reject the idea of collusion. What you have to do is actually be vigilant about figuring out where it has occurred so that you can drive the cost of colluding up too high to contemplate and reduce the amount of collusion that takes place, which is, you know, it's the opposite of where we are. We've, we've built a, uh, we've built a cloak for those who would conspire against us by pretending that it is sophisticated to ignore the possibility. Right. Yeah. And ignore the prosecution of people that, you know, should have been prosecuted for even earlier crimes before the ones that they were, you know, uh, still committing, you know, free of, free of, even the slightest bit of scrutiny it's it's kind of uh it's kind of crazy um, yep. what's going on in, in today's day and age and i think it, it's it's more than welcome now that in the, in this environment where we're waking up to the possibility that wow large scale conspiracies can exist where you can have a large number of you know scientists or academics or doctors um persuaded through means of you know also, it, it, I think it's important what you you talked about. I think on on the last podcast or the one before you did, where you talk about incentivized, you know, you, you, the, where the people and in or individuals are incentivized to go along with the narrative, and they're incentivized not to speak out against the narrative um, on an individual basis. And and this is this is a key part of how propaganda works, and that's why um, Bernays you know, titled his book, Crystallizing Public Opinion, because it's about this crystallization. And in order to have a crystal, you need a unit cell. And that unit cell needs to be motivated by, you know, the forces acting upon it, which are the incentives. Yep, that's very well put. Um, The fact is, you can manipulate an arbitrarily large number of people um, with a relatively simple modification of incentives. And in fact, you produce exactly what we've seen uh, over COVID and presumably in all the previous cases where you've got a tiny number of people who are built around a different architecture such that they are mostly or completely insensitive to the normal incentives. And those people immediately start looking around and saying, well, wait a minute, none of this adds up. And then you just have a wall of people insisting on things that obviously aren't true on the basis that they have all individually detected their incentives and are following them, whether they understand that that's what they're doing or not, whether they're, you know, collaborators or useful idiots. Um, the point is, it's if, if, if you're using consensus in order to figure out what's likely to be true, a consensus of experts or a consensus yeah. of the public, then you are very easily manipulated because a consensus can be arranged simply by shuffling incentives so that most people will respond to them. One of the things they did with the JFK assassination is they did not readily release the Zapruder film to the public. What they instead did is they let a Dallas news reporter by the name of Dan, Dan Rather, Rather. Um, tell the public what was on the contents of the Zapruder film. And from Dan Rather's incentive was, hey, I'm a young reporter trying to make a name for myself. And these guys promised me I'm a made man if I just sell their story for them. And it's completely shocking because, so I don't think most people know this piece of the story, right? We all, because we've seen the Zapruder film many times, have the sense that it's been around from the beginning. Right. Right. The point is, it was briefly shown and then Dan Rather installs whatever, whether he is a useful idiot or 
Uh, it was only shown to Dan Rather, and Dan Rather told the public what, what the first time it was shown on television was uh, 1968, I believe. Uh, no, oh, wait, no, maybe even later than that, years later. Um, I have to look that up. That's a good point because it wasn't until it wasn't until I think a decade later. It wasn't until like the 70s or something. I so thought. what the public had was Dan Rather describing and uh, even mimicking the motion of the president. And in exact, in perfect contradiction of what is shown in the film. I think it was like 78 that Geraldo showed it on TV for the first time. And is that was, right? Yeah. Huh. But what, so what we have is effectively a false memory installed in the public on the basis of a seemingly reliable source reporting what he's seen and say yeah. things that we can now compare to the film and can understand very simply are just false. Right. Yeah. No, it's a, it's a, it's very striking. And, uh, in terms of, uh, revealing how a false consensus is built, it is a, a truly remarkable piece of evidence. It's the anatomy of a psyop. You're the seeing of a psyop. Time. And, uh, yeah, I think it's, I think, uh, I think the public can't handle the truth, and if there's anyone uh, that will die by the by the revealing of the truth, then I, I say let them die. Well, I will I will go a different route, and I will say, a those who would collude against our knowledge always come up with some excuse where it's in our interest not to know the truth, and you know I'm sure some people can't handle the truth. I know that many of us can. But what I know for certain is that um, authorities cannot handle the power to decide when we are entitled to know the truth. There are, you know, in a, in a better society, they might be able to, but our society is so corrupt that frankly, um, the truth must come out because what we've been sold is uh, closer to the matrix, right? It's uh, more fiction than reality. And uh, everything is at stake, including life and limb, clearly. Yeah, I just don't understand how the intelligence agencies who, who call themselves intelligent um, can can live with the fact that at the end of the day, their their job is to lie to people and, and control people's minds through what the information that they have exposure to and, and don't. And that's, it seems to be the name of a lot of the game is of counterintelligence anyway, um, rather than just pure people that work in, just in collecting intelligence and spying directly. But the whole idea of this counterintelligence that there are people that their job is to lie to you and make sure that you're misdirected and that your perception is managed. Um, to yeah. a degree where you, you're, you're, you won't even ask to be able to ask the right questions to get to the truth. So it's, it's, it has it's lost a nice place to be, man. But, and, and I, I can't imagine the people that want to be on that side of that and want to make money and be paid and live with themselves doing that for a job every day where you're just like, all right, I want to, I want to disinform people. I don't want to bring humanity up. I gotta, I gotta be that boot that stomps them down as, as you know, further and further into the ground so that, you know, my bosses can stand up just that inch higher off their, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Uh, they've, they have lost any right to manage. I mean, not that they had any right to manage public perception, but um, whatever limited interest there might be in uh, controlling information, they have so abused that uh, that privilege that it certainly does not exist at this point. It's like, I, I heard lots of kids when I was younger who wanted to grow up and become teachers, but none that wanted to do the opposite of what teachers do. <laughs> <laughs> to to anti-teach. Yeah. Agreed. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, Jeremy, where can people find you? So YouTube alien scientist is my channel. Um, I go live periodically. You can reach me at thealienscientist at gmail.com, one word, if you want to email me. Um, I also have a website, alienscientist.com. You can go and contact me maybe through there and uh, reach out. And I'm also on Twitter at alien underbar scientist. 
So all right. feel free to reach out anywhere one of those platforms. Fantastic. Well, I really appreciate you joining me. Uh, this has been very enlightening and uh, hopefully real honest to goodness aliens will find their way here and bypass the government and talk to some of the few adults who are still running around on this planet. I like your idea of the, sig- the signal. We got, I got to start putting that out. And, and <laughs> yeah. Cool. Just All right. Well, I'll pass the government. What do you need them for? Yeah, Let's what not do you empower need them for? any more than they have already empowered themselves on our All behalf right. with our tax dollars. And <laughs> exactly. <and> our scientists. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, it's been a real pleasure and uh, good luck. And hopefully uh, Michael Shermer or someone else will take you up on your offer. Awesome. Thank you for hosting me, Brett. Sure. Awesome podcast. Be well, everyone.